Two-door SUV convertibles, six-figure super sedans made by Volkswagen, and panel vans with launch control. Come on guys, today here are 10 cars that don't deserve the tires that they sit on. Welcome back to Idealist, let's go. And real quick, I wanna thank today's sponsor, Graphics. We all know that EVs are the future and graphics is a game changer. You see, a bill called the Inflation Reduction was signed into law August 16th of 2022. And one of the biggest aims was a $500 billion act to get more electric cars on the road. So they decided to give a $7,500 tax credit to anyone who wants to buy. The catch? Well, 40% of the car's battery needs to be material sourced and or processed in the US to get credit. The problem is that very few batteries actually meet the standard today. One of the hardest components to get is graphite, and that's where graphics comes in. See, processing graphite into an anode makes up close to 25% of the entire battery, and they're one of the few companies in the entire country that have experience processing and manufacturing graphite anode, and they're willing to do it outside of Asia. So, when eco manufacturers are incentivized to buy, build, and process materials locally to qualify for that tax credit, there's only a limited number of companies to buy from. Go check out graphics if you're interested in learning more. We'll link to it down below. Now, back to the show. Nissan Juke. Now, you may or may not agree because they did make the Juke R, a 600 horsepower fire breathing tarmac slaying machine with all wheel drive and a GTR motor. I mean, guys, what is not to like? Well, it's little bro, the base Juke. It drives okay. It's good on gas, but it's looks. It tries to combine the practicalities of an SUV and a hatchback. But the problem is the bold design language didn't really succeed and the end result just isn't all that practical. At least you could get it personalized from the factory. Now, to try to bolster sales, Nissan also sent it off to the racing division, Nismo. But the problem was that they didn't give it much power and it costs as much as a brand new STI. So the joke, I mean the juke, it was just ugly, slow, impractical, and confused. So why was it even made? We asked the same question about this next car, the Honda CRZ. Honda CRZ. Yeah, yeah, on paper, a sporty hybrid seems like a great idea. I mean, some of the fastest hybrid cars in the world have hybrid systems similar to the one in the little CRZ. So how could this become a miss? Honda's execution for once just wasn't all there. The little hybrid four-cylinder put out a measly 130 horses. Good enough for a zero to 60 in about the same time it takes you to read a novel. And that's longer than it takes you to like and subscribe to Ideal. So hit the like button and subscribe if you're new. And the fact that Honda tried to make it a sports car by taking out the rear seats and pairing it with a manual transmission made it pretty impractical. Although it was fun to drive like a Miata as far as handling is concerned, but as a sports car, well, it wasn't one. So it wasn't very sporty or economical, which begs the question of why it was even built in the first place. Sort of like this next car, the Volkswagen Six Figure Phaeton. Volkswagen Phaeton. Okay, close one eye, squint with the other, and you probably would mistake this for a Passat, but no, it is a $100,000 plus Volkswagen Phaeton, a car that Volkswagen lost more than $25,000 on every single one that it was produced and sold. It was the state-of-the-art luxury car from the non-luxury brand. If it was an Audi or even a BMW, it would have made sense, but Volkswagen's known for value and economy, not luxury. And even with that big W12 power plant and the most trick technology offered in any car at the time, it was this steed that didn't make a whole lot of sense at the time and honestly still doesn't today. And while the Phaeton tends to fly under the radar, this uh, truck, it does not. Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet. Now this is an automotive oddity. It was supposed to offer the practicality of a crossover and the freedom of a convertible. Yeah, kind of sounds like a Jeep. But it was the blend of two things literally no one asked for in a truck. In its first three years on market, they only managed to sell just 5,500 units total. Everything, and I mean everything about it was uh, unconventional. But the worst part about the cross cab was its price tag. Yeah, it started at 46,390 bucks back in 2011. That was the same price as a gently used Range Rover. And speaking of Range Rovers, ever heard of the Evoke convertible? 
While the Cross Cabriolet costs just over 46 grand, you could pony up a few more bucks and get yourself a much nicer Vogue convertible, if for some reason you're into that sort of thing. So, what was Nissan thinking about the Murano Cross Cabriolet? An expensive but cheaply made two-door convertible SUV. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Just like this honorable mention, baby. Dodge Dakota Sport Convertible. Now, the Dodge Dakota Sport Convertible is the first convertible pickup truck from a major manufacturer since, get this, the Ford Model A. It was a sales failure, just like the Cross Cab and Evoque. But it's a fascinating slice of automotive history, when manufacturers were actually willing to experiment with out-of-the-box ideas. And today, they're actually considered pretty cool. If you ever wanted to win Radwood, this little truck might just give you the best shot possible. Unlike this bizarre Mini, Mini Club Van. As my mom says, big things come in small packages. And small packages come in vans. But when Mini tried to use its classic compact charm and blend it with commercial van practicality, ugh, things didn't go exactly as planned. It would have been a fine car, but it was aimed at small businesses that wanted something with a little style and urban practicality. But being so small and putting a premium on usable cargo space, the club van with only two seats and limited storage didn't really appeal to, well, anyone. Sales were so poor in the US, it was only available for one single year. I guess there's a reason that most cargo vans are built on big truck chassis. And while the Chevy SSR isn't a cargo van, it is another confused mashup that should just have never been created. Chevrolet SSR. At a glance, SSR appears to be a retro style pickup, which it is, but check this out. It's a retro styled convertible pickup. Uh, I guess things are more fun topless. Helen speaking. How can I help you? Yeah, hi. Chevy? What, what were you thinking? To make it even worse, GM put a hard cover over the truck bed, so you're limited in what you can actually haul around. At least they did do one thing right. They put in a monstrous LS2 engine under the hood. There are a few brave souls that even optioned it with a manual transmission. The result was a weird combination of retro hot rod truck that cost as much as a new Corvette at the time. I guess this is a very good reason why no one else has ever built a convertible pickup since. And that brings us to the awkward cousin that is just as equally confusing. Chevrolet HHRSS panel. Okay, you guys remember the Chrysler PT Cruiser, right? How could you not? Somehow, Chevy saw something in it. How? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. But they hired the head designer of the PT to design them their own retro hatchback. And the result was this funky HHR. I mean, they offered a business-oriented panel version, and they offered a sporty SS model. But what the world wasn't ready for was when they combined the two and offered the HHR SS panel. Out were the rear doors, windows, and back seats, and in was a beefy turbocharged engine complete with launch control. Yes, seriously, the Chevy HHR SS panel has factory launch control. Strange, but... Maybe even more so is the strangeness of Toyota CHR. Toyota CHR. Okay, for starters, it's just plain ugly if you ask me. And that's thanks to its peculiar proportions. You can even ask Toyota why it's called the CHR, and you're gonna get two conflicting answers. Either Compact High Rider or Coupe High Rider. Even they don't even know where it got its name. Now the CHR is this weird hatchback crossover coupe compact thing. Luckily the CHR was relatively cheap. Maybe that's the C in CHR. But this next car is not cheap because the Cadillac ELR was anything but that. Cadillac ELR. The year was 2014 and Cadillac, well, they wanted to hop on the EV wave. But instead of starting from the ground up, they took the underpinnings of the Chevy Volt and smeared some Cadillac flair on it? Instead of creating a four-door Volt, Cadillac wanted an upscale two-door version. So the result was this beautiful $76,000 uh, Chevy Volt. Considering that the Volt started at $35,000, the $76,000 base price tag sounded insane. And for that price, you received a fully electric range of a whopping 
39 miles. So the ELR made absolutely no sense to consumers, but guess what? It's the Toyota Avalon TRD that makes the least sense of all the cars on this list. Toyota Avalon TRD. The Toyota Avalon is aimed at older folks and their parents that don't want the flashiness or price of a Lexus. So what does Toyota do? They stiffen the suspension, put on bigger brakes, and this bold body kit. Toyota essentially made a version of the Avalon into what not a single Avalon buyer wanted. I mean, we're all in for full-size luxury cars that get sporty touches here and there, but a TRD Avalon? That's about as tone-deaf as you can get. What? <laughs> oh outro. So, which one's the least ideal? Let us know down below or let us know if we missed one. Go check out this fit up here or whatever YouTube recommends you watch next. Also, like, subscribe, turn on that notification bell. I'm Brad, this is Ideal, and promise me one thing, keep living the ideal lifestyle.